Here we go. How you doing, everybody? This is Dennis Michelson. Welcome to the Science of Fantasy Football. Why the Science of Fantasy Football? What's that all about? Well, when you put a meteorologist and a biologist together, they're going to use the scientific method that is guaranteed to make you a smarter fantasy football. How can I give a guarantee in a chaotic game like fantasy football? Well, by using the scientific method, we're using statistics in a smarter way. And statistics are what the game of fantasy football is all about. Joining me as he does each and every week, fresh back from the Fantasy Football Expo in Canton, Ohio, it's the Professor John Bush. John, how you doing today? Oh, uh, great, Dennis. We, you and I had a great time at Expo, saw some really neat folks, uh, loved the Hall of Fame. It was the Hall of Chiefs. <laughs> uh, wasn't the Hall of Fame for the Saints fans. I think they had <laughs> Drew Brees's, uh Super Bowl jersey hidden by in in the broom closet. I had to open it up, and things were falling on me. And there it was, kind of glowing. <laughs> and then I had my five seconds of, okay, this is this is why I'm a Saints fan. And then the door closed, and you know I'm going to be sad for the next uh, twenty. Dennis, I could die before I see another Saints <laughs> Super Bowl. So it's it's. I enjoyed it at the time, but I just, you know, un unlike the Chiefs, it's like I was tripping over uh, Andy Reid's face shields and crap. They had, they had, you know, his mustache comb and God knows what else that they're collecting for the Chiefs fan. You know, the dirt off Mahomes' cleats, you know, and the, the, t the signed Taylor Swift stuff by Kelsey. It's like, what is this stuff here? It was it was crazy. It was the Hall of Fame for the Chiefs. It looked like so, but they weren't a dynasty. And Dennis, oh, was, yeah. was was not pleased to see that this here. So the Chiefs have been. I think they're going to have to update that, Dennis. I mean, I'm a I'm a Saints fan, but I have to give the the evil Chiefs their due. And I think they're dynasty like it, you know, so we'll see. But I, I think that needs to be changed pretty soon and probably will be. We'll get to maybe tour it again once, uh, you know, the Saints win the Super Bowl. I guess I'll go back. <laughs> and maybe they'll start having some Saints stuff. Yeah. It, it, here's, here's the thing. There was a huge board. With all the records yeah, and the that was Super amazing. Bowls yeah. of, of every team. There was a long drought between Chiefs Super Bowls. Yes. But that that grouping, that tight grouping of great seasons that extended right through last year. Yeah. That length of time was as long as most of the other teams that they had declared as dynasties. So I I think the Chiefs are, are ready, but hey, when we get the three peat, there'll be no denying it. Yeah. You know, in another 10 years too, after Mahomes has won another six of these things, it, it's gonna be hard to to walk into the Hall of Fame without tripping over even more Kansas City Chiefs gear. Yeah, it was everywhere. It's crazy. It's like it, an infestation is what it was. It, it, and here's the thing. I just hope Mahomes and Kelsey play long enough until their kids yeah. are playing for the Chiefs and winning more Super Bowls. That would be that would be great. But no, it was a good time yep. out there at the Fantasy Football Expo. But, Professor, yep. I got a gripe. Oh, boy. So we won't Whoa. name names. We won't name names. Is this about the expo, Greg? This is about the expo, but it, it also is about some recent it, articles that I've seen coming out because we're entering that magical three weekends now where it's fantasy football draft, like the casuals have even started drafting now. Mm -hmm. So the next couple of weekends are going to be very busy draft weekends in fantasy football and... I'm really tired of this. Mm -mm. 
I'm tired of one consistent thing that keeps happening in fantasy football, whether it's talking to people at the expo, whether it's seeing articles online. Professor, oh, when you when you write an article, when, when people write articles on fantasy football, now I know that we define the terms that we use. I had an entire glossary when I did a whole thing about different things and any term I used, I defined it. You did. But, but simple terms like fade and smash and my guy even. Nobody defines these things when they put them out. Are, are they just not defining them so they can come back next year and tell you they were right when they leave it so open-ended like that? I don't know, Dennis. What do you think? How, how many draft spots are there in a fade? If you say I'm fading a certain player, Let's say you say, I'm fading C.J. Stroud at his current ADP. How many draft positions make up a fade? Like, is that a round? Is it two rounds? Is it five picks? I, I just wish people, when they write articles, well-thought-out articles, I'm not questioning the articles here. I'm not questioning on the advice of this guy is a not a good choice at ADP. That's that's good advice. And I may disagree with you on a particular player, but if it's within the range of logical outcomes, I'll say, okay. But if you don't define it, if I don't know what the word fade means in your vernacular, because I asked a bunch of people today, Professor, Mm -hmm. I got an answer from five to 10 to I'm not taking that guy. That's a big difference. That's a huge difference. And, you know, there is, well, there's a, there's several fantasy football players that I will not draft at any price this year. You ready really? for my list? You ready really? for my list? Yeah. Okay. I will not take OJ Simpson. Yeah. He, and I'm he. not, dra I'm not drafting Henry Sugg or Henry, Henry Ruggs. Sorry. You didn't botch the guy's name. Yeah. Other than that, if even guys that I'm not crazy about in the first round, I, I won't take Garrett Wilson in the first round. Gotcha. But, it, but if he falls 10 spots from where he's going right now, 15 spots, anytime a guy falls a round later than the consensus ADP, mm -hmm. I'm looking at him. Case in point, the Scott Fishbowl live draft. I did not even put Trey McBride on my draft sheet because I thought he would be gone long before his consensus ADP in the early Scott Fishbowl drafts and the mock drafts mm -hmm. said he was going early second round. Still on the board when my pick came in round three. Guess who I took? You took him? Absolutely. A, a guy who was not a value to me at pick 18 or 20, at pick 28, now I've got to reconsider what I'm doing. And since the other three tight ends that I really like this year were all off the board and only one other bonus guy was sitting there as a possibility. I mean, Mark Andrews was gone before McBride in that draft. Hmm. I got to my point in the draft. I had two quarterbacks, super flex league, feeling pretty good. Knew I had some guys coming up at running back and wide receiver that I liked that I could get later. I saw him and I just <laughs> signed me up. So I faded him. But in my case, that fade was only five spots. So I'm not even sure I'd call it a fade. I just didn't like him in the second, but I loved him in the third. Why don't people define things? That's that's my gripe and my pet peeve of the day. Okay. Uh, I have 
an answer that we're actually, I think I can bring up in our ADP, but my old friend, the box and whisker, Ooh. when I apply that to our metrics, I can tell you using that simple tool, what is upper or lower whisker. And so I can define when it gets interesting, when you leave the box going up, that's very intriguing to me. When you're down in the lower whisker, that's very scary for me. So that's going to move as we go down the, the draft. So we have positional rankings based on our weekly metrics. We're, we're, we're doing five this year. Uh, tested them. I don't know if it's what of the five are good. Maybe they're equally good. Maybe there's a weighted difference that we need to take two that should be 80% of our ranking and the other three could be 20%. We don't know. We hadn't done the experiment. That's all about the science of fantasy football. We're doing that this year and we will have more clarity. We may not have a complete answer for a few more years. So when when Dennis and I discuss these kind of terms, our timeline is even different. In other words, I'm I would include Dennis in a fade definition. Is that always I fade at you know six spots? In other words, is that just something I've seen in my diary that has helped me? In other words, I can go and show you, yeah, the last five years when I've called the fade and, and only took them after five spots lower or whatever, it turns around okay for me. In other words, there there is some metrics that you can point to that lead you to those lines in the sand versus if it's squishy, and I forgot what I said last year. It doesn't matter. But nobody <laughs> nobody remembers what I said except fantasy receipts. And, uh, you know, so the time scale, Dennis, that we are working on is way different than, no offense, pretty much anybody that's really out there on with these definitions and things. So I think there's a timeline you know, it's like, well, I used to think fades meant around later, but now my diary says only should be half around. Whatever, that's fine. I'm not upset if you've changed your definition because you got some data that says you win more money, you know, fading by six spots versus a, a, a round. That means you probably didn't get them is, is the explanation. In other words, you really were down on them, but you kind of had to come back because there's still some value there. So that adds to the mix, Dennis. That that that's like adding that Tabasco to the gumbo there. <laughs> it just that that hot, that that sour, that balance, right? You when you watch food competitions, you know they'll say you should add in more acid or you know a little bit too much salt and you know, that's like fantasy. You know, it's, 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 you could think it's a visceral, you can almost taste those values. And yeah, that's what a fade tastes like. It's like that, that feeling, you know, that, that sour milk, you know, in the back of the back or that, that, that stuff on the crust to your mayonnaise. And you're thinking, is this mayonnaise <laughs> still in date? Well, I really want this fried bologna sandwich. We do our bologna down here in the Ooh, south. And we fry love it. my bologna. Love yeah, my fried bologna. Yeah, but bologna. we fry it down here. Everything, love, love my fried bologna. Everything's good in Crisco oil that's Ooh, been fried. Yeah. And we put that. But, you know, that last scrape of that crusty mayonnaise. It's not even mayonnaise anymore. It's like, <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's this new thing that sits back there. You know, back in college, you know, you'd have stuff in the back of that or free, you know, behind the beers, you know, the two oh, yeah. cases back there was some of the condiments. And uh, anyway, so there's a timeline and there needs to be a reason and there needs to be 
some you need critical understanding versus you spouting stuff versus you know my diary last five years every fate i've declared has uh you know and if i uh, got into you know i said so and so was a fate and i still took them you know and where i took them it cost me money then that's a good way to build a definition it applies to you. The thing is, when people say that, Dennis, they, it may not apply to somebody else. Somebody else, believe it or not, I know Dennis, Dennis, he's, he's a sharp dog, but some people can be better, Dennis, at us. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, yeah uh, absolutely. And if it works for them, you know, I need to test it for myself. So I'm kind of an Eeyore that way. So I would add to your gripe, timeline there and i i would like consistency you know that weekly consistency that dennis and i are always shooting for in players i think our uh, our fellow fantasy uh researchers or experts or whatever they want to call themselves should have a timeline talk about the last 20 fades and where it became profitable i think you'll find your definition that way and when I say I'm fading a player, it, it's a little bit different because it is sort of a sliding scale. So, for instance, if Trey McBride is going off, he's, you know, ADP says he's going off as the second or third uh, tight end at the time I was doing that draft. That's what he was scheduled to go was tight end three. I had him ranked as tight end four. I thought his downside potential was about tight end six. Now, I knew that he was the last of the safe harbors at tight end, but I was willing to chance that. Even with in a tight end premium league, I was like, I'm cool with that. If I don't end up with a top tight end, you know, at my draft position, that's that that's the breaks. I'll find <laughs> other values later on in the draft, whether it's a freer mooth, whether it's a kittle. There, there's ports in the storm at each entrance from the ocean and you know i just looked at him and said you know i cannot believe that people are looking the other way and letting him slide i'm not letting him slide anymore but the way i determined that is using my mvp index and i knew that there was a big drop in tears between my tight ends after him and i'll be dogged if i was going to be hanging out there is the last one to get one. So I took him when, when that was it. But for instance, CJ Stroud's another classic example where I've got him ranked as my quarterback 10 this year using my MVP index. He doesn't have that solid floor as far as well, I shouldn't say he's, he's got a more solid floor. He doesn't have the higher ceiling because he doesn't have the rushing yards. Doesn't have the rushing touchdowns. So that's kind of limiting his upside. But if 12 quarterbacks go in the draft and he's still there, all of a sudden I got to recalculate when it comes to my turn in the draft. I might have an idea of somebody who also is still on the board right then. And maybe I can go one more round for that guy. For, for instance, Jordan loves my guy this year. When it comes to my quarterback that I'm building teams around. So what's your definition of your guy? I knew you're going to ask me and I've got it. Okay. Okay. So my guy yeah. in the terms of Jordan so, love is the cheapest quarterback I can get. Yeah. That is likely to have an MVP index of over 90. Gotcha. He's not alone. Yeah. It, Kyler Murray's down in that group. Dak Prescott's in that group. Joe Burrow is in that group, but Love's kind of at the top. So of if you like Love better than Burrow or Prescott? Yes. Yes. How much, le how much better? I've got Love at a 100 yeah. MVP yeah. versus Burrow at a 94. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Versus, ver versus a Prescott at 86. Now, 194, that's six points. That's not a big deal. 
I've also got Kyler Murray at 103. But Jordan Love got a 100 as a rookie. Basically a rookie. His first year in the league, okay? I know he wasn't a real rookie. He'd been sitting for a while, but he's never been a starter in the pros. And he posted a 100. There were only three quarterbacks that did that last year. So if he comes back to 90% of that, that's now a 90. And that's a significant contributor to your fantasy football okay. team. And I, and I get him in the ninth uh, round in I just, FPPC. Uh, Dennis, I just got him in the ninth round. And I oh. had Burrow, Prescott, and Love. And I was just the lucky vibe that you told me. I just grabbed Jordan Love. Uh in 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 a draft so there you go my first quarterback 905 and burrow was still there uh and prescott's right there so hey. in, in fact i may even slip through here depends on when i come up again i come up in 1008 if burrow and prescott one of those is still there Ooh. i might double up I would take that double eight. up. I would take that double up. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It, it, and here's the thing, Professor, yeah. is Jared Goff came in with a 75. Yeah. That's very solid as an yeah. MVP. Yeah. Now he only plays three games outside. Yeah. So, so you figure he's... there's some room to go up towards Prescott's 86. Oh, absolutely. So I look at the – and he's coming even cheaper in the draft. He so, is cheaper. So, and Professor, that whole idea of having two quarterbacks, usually if I take a Jordan Love or I take even a more, you know, elite guy, I take a Josh Allen, I take a Mahomes, I take a Hurts, I'm probably not going back for another quarterback in my draft. But you developed some very secret sauce. <laughs> when, when you started looking at a combination of factors, and we aren't even going to tell you what the combination of factors are, folks. Yeah. But what we will tell you is that under certain circumstances, a quarterback can have a 20% advantage in production versus other circumstances. I plan on beta testing that all year long, Professor, and yeah. putting it to the test to see if we can find those overlaps of good games where they're getting those, all the, all the things align yeah. and we yeah. gain that advantage over our other quarterback who doesn't have all those things aligning. I think going to war this season in fantasy football with two quarterbacks from this group. And I say this group because they're all coming cheap. I'm shocked at how cheap Burrow is going. Kyler Murray, Jordan Love, Dak Prescott, Jared Goff, and the the last guy is Justin Herbert. Now, Herbert nursing a foot injury. I don't like that. Justin Herbert on a team that might throw less than those other teams, I'm not crazy about that. But you're but getting if I, a break in price. But you're getting him dirt cheap. He was going in the 13th round before his injury. Now you can sometimes get him as late as 14 or 15. So I look at, and he's my second quarterback too, folks. So I look at the games where he's going to be going, where I know he's going to have to throw because they're going to be playing from behind, but that the defense isn't that great. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at the stars aligning with our secret sauce. And he's got maybe five games this year where he's going to have a huge advantage. So our draft night out, this is how you have to play quarterback, okay, in today's fantasy football. You've got to gain advantages when you can. Our draft night out, one quarterback league. We got Jordan Love. We got him nice and cheap. We love that. Yeah, yeah. So when we came back looking at other quarterbacks, we got sniped a couple of times. We would have taken Dak. We would have taken Goff. They were gone before they came back to us. I'm cool with that. 
Week 10, when Jordan Love is off, the Carolina Panthers are playing the New York Giants. Bryce Young was our 17th round pick, last pick in the draft for us. One yeah. more pick after us, good old tip major. Yep. But the key was, I like to, if I'm going to stream a quarterback, I'm streaming him against a team like the Giants. I'm happy with that. And so there's there's a situation where I didn't get the ideal. I didn't get my double good quarterback double up. But I got a space holder. And as long as love stays healthy, I'm fine. But that's the way you've got to play quarterback. You got to gain every every advantage that you can at the position this year. And and I've done a little more research. So it's no question my MVP forecast will be revised this weekend. And it's taken Jalen Hurts down a little bit. Hmm. I'm a little concerned about the offensive line for Philadelphia. I'm a little concerned that Jalen Hurts saw some fall off in his production late in the season last year. I still think he's a heck of a quarterback, but when you're drafted as high as he is, he's got to be the best. And he's, he might not be, I might have Josh Allen and Mahomes again uh, above him. And I hate Josh Allen's fantasy football playoff schedule this year for Buffalo. I've never been fond of it because he's playing outdoors in horrible weather quite often in Buffalo. But this year he gets bad teams, tough teams to go up against. So I'm loving this later quarterback idea. And you're getting a value. So take two back-to-back rounds even if you have to and be fine in one quarterback leagues. I'm perfectly happy with that. In super flex leagues, I like having an elite guy if I can get him. Then I'll take one from the middle tier and I'll take one from the third tier. I want I want three quarterbacks in Superflex, and I don't want to wait too long. But you can get a Kirk Cousins, a Stafford, a Goff, maybe take a chance on a rookie like, you know, Jaden Daniels or Caleb Williams if the price is right in your draft. But that's the way I'm going to play this position this year at quarterback. I think it's a little deeper, but I still think there's some advantages. But that secret sauce you showed me, Professor, it's <laughs> it is got me going. But that again, at quarterback, it all comes down to me on the ADP. I like it. I'm uh, looking forward to your forecast. Uh, currently, right now, we're beta testing kind of your uh, MVP. Is it? was un unchanged and that that's cooked into our ADP analysis here that that I think it's a good time to segue into Dennis yeah absolutely yeah so let me see if I can uh pull this out here and professor as you're trying to do that as you're getting that ready for to show us because yeah. I haven't seen this yet, folks. This is brand no, new, yeah, brand like new stuff. It. Yeah. So, so let me just quickly share with the class. Okay. So, ADP and me mm-hmm. years ago, okay. I did not pay as much attention to ADP. I was a disciple of Dodds from the football guys. I calculated my value based drafting cheat sheet. Mm -hmm. And I would often take a guy who I probably could have gotten, should have gotten, should have waited to get him in the fourth round at running back or wide receiver. And I'd take him in the second because he was my 15th ranked and the 15th ranked guy was going off the board. And by golly, I was taking my 15th guy right there. But professor, you changed my mind. You opened my mind when you started doing this ADP analysis and I realized more and more that if you wait 
you can sometimes get two for one deals. So yes, ADP says that this player, for instance, is going like Pacheco was going in the fourth round all the time. I was taking him around early in the third, but I've got him rated second round, but why take him in the second when you can get him in the third guaranteed? Like 95% of the time, you're going to get him in the third. And if somebody reaches farther than you, fine. It's just like being in an auction draft where you might say, okay, this guy is worth 10% of my bank. I might go to 15%. I'm not going higher. He goes up to 22%. You're still drafting him. Now you're building yourself into a hole with less money. Your ADP studies have really opened up a new way of looking at drafting. And since we've been working together on this ADP stuff, and I'm watching what you do and what you're teaching us, including me on ADP, mm -hmm. using the data, I have, I have become a better drafter. I'm getting more of these two for ones than I ever did before because I'm understanding the trends that are happening and how those trends are changing over time. And your studies are the reason that I'm getting better at handling ADP. Well, thank you, Dennis. Uh, so folks, I, I use a top down approach, uh, a deconstruction approach. That's how I was trained as a biologist. Uh, it's systems analysis to understand you have to break things down. Okay. It's much easier to visualize top down. I, I think I said the expo, uh, if I have a square ice cube and we watch it melt and we have a puddle, we kind of, yeah, we know it's a square ice cube. But if you didn't know the shape of the ice cube, I just walked over and showed you the puddle, you'd be like, uh, was it round? Was it one of those half moon? Uh, shaped ice cubes? Was it a kind of a meteorite looking ice cube? What was it? So it's a lot easier to go top down. And in biology, when we're looking at the ecosystems, if you're looking at an animal and their behavior, it's best to understand where they're at, where they're living, what plants, animals, the soil, the weather, the uh, temperatures, you know, so you got abiotic and biotic information that you have to weave in for a greater understanding of the organism. If you're studying uh, marmots up in the Rocky Mountains, it's good to understand, okay, it's in the mountains, uh, vegetation, and this is the seasons and these kind of things. So I treat that uh, as my approach to ADP. And the first figure here, and we're recording this uh, uh, on Zoom, so we'll get in the visuals, Dennis, so people can see that. So we have uh, each dot is a, a player taken, and the positions are each line. Wide receiver, tight end, running back, quarterback, defense, and place kicker. I'm not using that in best ball. I played the slim version. Uh, at FFPC, and we don't have to worry about place kickers and defenses. And uh, this year I'm streaming both, so I know who I want uh, in rounds uh, 19 and 20. So for me, the show is rounds for uh, 1 to 18. And, I, you know, I've got two or three picks to stream for week one, and then I'm off from there since it's a, a redraft. It's not a best ball. Uh, some things that I've noticed, Dennis, since uh, we started doing this way back uh, earlier this year, uh, kind of running backs are easing up a little bit, uh, but uh, wide receivers are still doing well round one. Uh, in the tight end premium in these redrafts, uh, the tight ends are getting more scarce and they're going earlier than they were in best ball. So that was a change, me switching over. Quarterbacks are going later in redrafts versus best ball by about a round or so even later. Josh Allen's in the fourth now, 
And in best ball, you could see him going late second, then as people were oh, yeah. getting antsy yep. and wanted to start taking their quarterback second and third round. I mean, people were just – it was a different atmosphere. So, folks, you need to know going in. So this is what I'm playing. I'll try to play about 50 of these leagues. I'm in, uh, I guess, 11 or 12 right now. Dennis and I are having to bounce back and forth, make sure we don't end up in the same league. We don't we don't need two sharks in the small barrel of fish. <laughs> Okay. We, you know, I don't want scraps. I don't want Dennis to scrap. So Dennis and I are avoiding each other. And uh, I think it's best ball. We ended up in a couple just by mistake. And it was kind of fun. I think we did a riff on that uh, earlier in, in one of our podcasts on the best ball. But anyway, Dennis, uh, this is the map going in. So I can always consult this. But for instance, if you're not a, a streamer, Defenses are starting to show up even in the 13th round, Dennis. Wow. Can, can, you know, 14, 15. There, there are four taken. There's, I guess, six taken by rounds into round 16. Wow. Folks, uh, you know, unless your diary somehow shows you that that's helped you, I just – there's RBs, especially rookie RBs and 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 some of these handcuff handcuffs that are so valuable. If you look at Dennis's better than zero, which we did in our our draft out, what night draft out or whatever it was. Yeah. You and I, yeah. We were what the last four was pretty much um, uh running backs there, some of these. So it's like you're you're losing. I think you're costing yourself a valuable piece that could turn into something by drafting, uh, a, a, you know, a defense or even a, a place kicker, Dennis, coming into round 15. Some people are drafted a defense and a kicker by round 16. I'm telling you, folks, I'm not. I'm waiting to rounds. Uh, 19 and 20. So that's just me this year. And so that and here's the, yeah, here's the ahead. thing, professor. So our draft night out mm -hmm. 17 rounds. Yeah. Yeah. We, we ended up with nine running backs. Yeah. No kicker nope. and no defense. Now we are perfectly fine with going ahead and streaming kickers and defense. We've had great success doing that. Mm -hmm. But you you know who my number one kicker is? Uh, when I, I no, I, when I, I look at consistency of kickers, yeah. my number one kicker is Jake Elliott. He's still on the board after everybody stopped drafting. So we can get Philadelphia's kicker if that's who we want. We want to get my number one kicker is still available. My number one defense, if I'm not streaming this year, mm -hmm. And I'm looking for a defense. And when I say number one defense, that's a defense that I think I can get pretty late. If I have to take some leagues, you have to take FFPC. You have to take it. Yeah, defense. they will block you, folks, if you've yeah. never played. So come round 19, I can't grab an RB or a WR or a tight end no. or quarterback. Nope. No. It's blocked. No. So, so sometimes in those leagues, I will go. I'll have a guy that I know is going to be there at, at round 20. Oh yeah, because he's a he's a handcuff RB or wide receiver, okay. And I know that nobody is going to take this guy because he's kind of that reach. Hey, last year one of my reaches in the last round was Puka Nakua. I'm just saying. Yep. So it, it that was early in the draft season. By the time it got to this time last year, we were moving him up to about 15th or 16th round. Yeah. But my number one defense that I think is going to be available after about six or seven at least are taken and I still like them is the Houston Texans. And nice. one study that I saw recently that I read recently, I've haven't done too much study on defenses because we are good at streaming them. We know that, but the stickiest feature when it comes to good fantasy football defenses is win loss record. Houston's going to have a good team. Houston's going to have a really good offense. They're going to be playing from ahead. 
quite often. And that's what you want for your fantasy defense. Now, I don't know how many points they're going to give up, probably a little bit more. So if your league really is stingy, but the FFPC isn't, you don't get penalized a lot if your team is sort of in the median for points scored against them. But I'm loving that Houston Texans defense. And guess what? In our draft night out league, they're still on the board. So we've got options, even though we left the draft without a defense and kicker, we'll add one. We'll make a cut. We'll maybe have somebody get hurt and go on IR. And we will be able to get the defense and kicker before round one. They're not going out of style. They'll be available. But I find this data shocking that people are taking them that early, Professor. Yep. I I can't help that. People, people are, are kind of crazy. So this next figure, again, we're still top down is a look at RBs and, and WRs. That's kind of where a lot of the show is, Dennis. Yep. And I like to know the ratio of the numbers picked each round. So I do a simple number ratio, and you see the rounds 1 to 20 and the different positions and the numbers taken. So round 1 is 5 RBs, 7 WRs, that's a 0.7, okay? So it, it's skewed to the WRs. Anything below one is WR skewed. Anything above one is uh, skewed to the RBs. So you can go through quickly just looking, and you can land upon round three and five. It's, look at the skew, six versus two RB. So people are skipping those rounds for RBs. And you're saying, well, okay, what do this data allows you to prepare? Dennis kind of hinted the 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 value so you at least know that if you've got a valuable RB say after the first nine it's very likely you can wait because of this to round four. You don't have to rush in round three. In other words, it would it could be a, a, a reasonable gamble. Same thing in round five. You could probably get them in round six. You have an opportunity. So you can then fish for other things like a elite tight end or a quarterback in those rounds. You know, you could get a, a WR, an RB in the first two rounds, maybe grab a tight end, round five, gra grab you uh, uh, a quarterback, and you haven't missed out on a nice uh, second RB. You're probably going to miss out on some WR, so that's the downside. It's not all peaches and cream there. You, Because people are really force-feeding themselves WRs, Dennis, if you look, uh, and I'll go through seven, five, six, 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 five, four, three by round eight. There's only three taken. Notice round eight is extremely RB heavy. Hmm. So that's kind of an opposite. If you like an RB that's going in round eight, everybody's going to be fishing in that pool. So you might have to get aggressive for your third or fourth RB if that's what you want. I'm not saying that's what you do, but this data prepares you for your decisions. I just don't like to be just kind of, you know, halfway asleep. It's like somebody wakes you up, you fall asleep in the late, <laughs> late show there or watching a an old Second City show or something, you know, back in Saturday Night Live. What did what I miss? What I Folks, we don't want you to draft with uh, waking up, what did I miss? How did that happen? What do you mean they grabbed my running back in round eight? I, how would you have known that? I'm telling you, the data is talking to you if you want to listen to it, folks. So I've set this up, and you can look at these metrics. So you can see round 13, the first defense is going off the board. Round 14, wow. the first kicker. 
So you're not, in other words, you're not surprised like, ruh row, how come that happened? You just, the top, if you like, say one of the top four QBs, they're gone by the end of round five. So you need to make a decision. Am I okay with missing on that or I got to have it? And you that's what, this is your planning tool. And I'll have this hard copy of all this up on our Science of Fantasy Football so uh, you don't have to listen to Dennis and I drone on and on again. You can just go look at the figure. I'll have it for you guys. So anyway, this is my planning tool. I have this, uh, and I just want to, it's, it's a reminder to wake up and figure out what I'm going to do. So you have skewed WRs, you have skewed RBs, you have pretty much even. And then you can track the QBs and the tight ends as well. So if you want, Dennis, one of the top tight ends, say the top seven, you got to go by a round three to try to get any Dennis. That's how crazy. And notice after round three, the early tight end people, they're happy. Seven, so half your league's going to be happy and won't think about another tight end until later. So if you wanted to make that strategy, rounds four, five, six, probably even to round seven, you know, you, you have an opportunity to, to get into there and, and take one of your late tight ends. And you're probably talking about some streaming and you're probably talking about maybe taking two back to back or pretty close to stream them in and out. So again, planning your strategy, but don't expect Kelsey to be there in round three. Don't expect Andrews to be there in round four. This data says it's just not going to happen, folks, and you shouldn't, you know, halfway wake up between your first six-pack and try to think, well, where did all <laughs> these people go? Folks, you 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 celebrate when you count that check in, in December or January, whenever you get your pay. That's when you go pop the champagne, not during the draft. Okay. So anyway, Dennis, uh, and then I'll show you this last thing here, uh, last two things on this pattern. So I use my WR, RB, uh, and I should have capitalized. Oh, that's a picture of that. Oh, no, it's not. Okay. Sometimes I have to change. It bugs me. So there it is. So uh, RB, WR drafted ratios, the distribution in 20 rounds. So I know where the box is. And I know the extremes that are going to happen. And there's some really extreme rounds for RBs, Dennis. Really extremes. And then I uh, graph that. Each circle represents the ratio. And the purple lines are the box. And you could see rounds three and five and 18 are WR skewed. And RB skewed is round eight. 11, a little bit in 14, 19 for sure. So you can just use this to kind of almost predict how things are going as far as the, the RBs and the WR. I'm telling you, this will help you out in your planning. You just, it's a roadmap. The, the data is talking to you. Do you want to listen? And we used this sort of thing to set up for our draft night out. So yes. I laid out the guys that I thought were the guys that we should be targeting. And we were drafting from the 11th spot. All of the wide receivers that I thought were first round logical guys were gone. So that determined our decision to go running back we were contemplating going running back running back first two rounds and then decided well let's open the vault at tight end and take kelsey and so we got derrick henry who we were reaching a few spots for i'm okay with reaching into the second round eligible players end of the first round because I really like his 
chance to be in double-digit touchdowns, which is what I was trying to build. Kelsey will be in double-digit touchdowns if he stays healthy. And then we came back in the third round, Professor. By the time we came around in the third round, there were 27 wide receivers taken, only 13 running backs. Yeah. We could get the 14th best running back. We got another guy who's likely to be double-digit touchdowns, Mixon. That was not how we had game-planned it. Nope. That's not how we thought this draft was going to go. We knew from the map that we were taking a tight well, end. There were some suspicious characters at that table. That tip, <laughs> he he got he put that bad <laughs> mojo on us. He he, you know, I he must be from Louisiana too. I just felt that <laughs> that, that voodoo. I mean, you know, I use a little bit of that. Dennis can speak. I I, I got my voodoo doll, and I said, Dennis, if I need to. Put the pin in your boss's. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say to get you fired here, but you know, the ball, Dennis will come in and he'll complain. I said, Dennis, no. here's, here's the voodoo doll. I just felt like Tip had some of that. He plays nice, but that man, he he he'll, he'll take your piece. He'll take your piece of cornbread if you let him. He's serious. So I, He's I'm suspicious serious. of him. Yeah, <laughs> if I'm at a Louisiana buffet and there's one piece of crawfish left. I, I'm going to have to go for it, Dennis. We may have to sword fight with the tongs, <laughs> but I'll take on Tip because I'll fight for that crawfish. No, Tip's a good guy, but so he's, Tip, he's, I'm, I'm a little bit crazy if you're listening. I'm sorry. He, uh, he's we, not a we just, But he, he, was, he was right there on top of us, Dennis. I just felt like he was every pick, his old <laughs> eyes were coming out watching us. and That just made me nervous. He is. He lives in Texas now, so maybe oh, he, I knew I was getting that Houston, vibe. I knew. He's from the Houston area, so maybe okay. he did. I maybe knew. he got relatives. He could have hey, relatives of, over you know, After Katrina, a lot of those yeah. folks they moved them down there and <laughs> took some of that voodoo with them. So I, I don't know. I, I I felt like he was trying to hex us a little bit, put that evil eye to us, and I was not happy about it wasn't he drafted right behind us and he was sniping us and oh yeah he, he was just a drag on my whole draft night out that man he was just he messed with our mojo i didn't like it he he made us th rethink a couple of rounds he where did. we we thought we knew what we were doing but old yeah, tip but beat old us tip, to the punch he was <laughs> he was uh we're gonna have to sit at another table next year well i don't want him there <laughs> But we were we were drafting against a lot of people that seem to folks. be they're yep. sharp, but there seemed to be I I picked up on about five that seemed to be going zero RB build, yeah. and that's when I decided that you know I said, hey professor, uh, we can be really strong at running back here, mm -hmm. and so we left with Derrick Henry. Yeah. Joe Mixon. Yep. And James Conner as our oh, top three well, running backs. I love that trifecta there, Dennis. That is a winning trifecta right there. Oh, yeah. Your, I, your, your dad and my dad up in heaven would approve <laughs> of that trifecta. That's the good basis of a trifecta box or an or a, or a part wheel right a there. Part we, wheel. Yeah. We had a Henry. Gun. <laughs> uh yep you're right henry in the first top, uh spot i love it well, that was a good deal but then we went with the chaos theory because <laughs> yeah. i'm not i'm not sold uh, now i'm not saying javante williams can't be a great running back okay playing hurt last year coming back off the knee injury his mvp index was below the 60 threshold that when I see that, I say the, the position's wide open. So either Javante Williams steps up and he closes that door, or Audric Estime, the rookie, could step up and do it. Gus Edwards and, and J.K. Uh, Dobbins haven't stayed healthy for the last seven years. We took Kamani Vidal, the rookie, with the chargers, we know the chargers are going to want to run. This was a pick that you talked me into and I'd absolutely loved it when you pointed this out. 
Tyler Algier, if anything happens to Bijan Robinson, Algier is going to step up and he's going to be about 80% of Bijan. Then we grab Chase Brown, who I really love. We grab Kendra Miller just in case something happens to Kamara. And we got uh, Garendo with San Francisco. That's the pick we'll probably have to drop in order to get a kicker or defense on the team. He's just had a trouble staying healthy here in training camp, but who cares? We know that there's value to be had backing up CMC this year. So all of our picks, I mean, one of the guys at the table dubbed it the chaos running back theory. We're, we're hoping for chaos, but what often happens at running back in fantasy football, we get the chaos paying off. So I, I'm really happy with the team that we got. And, you know, this is what I've been preaching to people for a long time. If you can have someone drafting with you or someone for draft advice who is as good or smarter than you are when it comes to the data and you team up with that person, it's not like one and one equals two. It's like one and one equals five when it comes to fantasy football. And I really appreciated your insight. The other guy that we grabbed that I probably would have let go. I'm loving having Tyler Lockett on that team as a backup wide receiver in case our top guys are off on a bye week or injury. You can plug lock it in and you know you've got a shot at an upside game anytime he's in the in the game. It's it's uh I love his upside. I know he's getting older in the tooth. I know they got a couple of other great wide receivers, but Tyler Lockett's got only has to catch one pass to pay off with a nice he score. He can get you 10, 10 points right there. One a touchdown and one forty catch. yards or something. Yeah, one catch and he can and he can light up your board. I love having that flexibility sitting on the bench, especially when our other bench wide receiver is the rookie, Keon Coleman. We don't have a clue what that guy is going to be like, but we do know what Tyler Lockett is, and we know that he is a good plug and play. Our other wide receivers, Pittman, Godwin, Jaden Reed, feeling good about that. When you can get Jaden Reed as your third wide receiver. That's nice. And you already have Henry, Mixon, and Connor at running back. I love the balance we've got, Professor, because we've got Jordan Love and Kelsey. We've got top five guys guaranteed at quarterback and tight end. And we've got probably double digit touchdown guys as our first two, if not three running backs, that's a lot of consistency, but it was this pattern recognition that helped us a lot to landing that team. Well, in my approach, the, these are tools to inspire your thinking. I'm not stuck on anything folks. But if, if you don't have something to guide you or start your process, and that's why I love Dennis and I's metrics. And this year we're beta testing all five of them. Uh, We're trying to uh, use that as a gauge. We don't know in the, uh, so I simply just took all five Scaled them to zero to 100, 100's the best. Scaled it and just did an average. I don't know if that's the best approach, but we, you know, we got to start somewhere. And again, our timeline is over years. And I I don't hear that discussed a lot out there. Uh, You know, it's like, well, what are you going to do next year? I don't know. I can tell you, I can see a timeline for us the next three years. This is our first year beta testing. Next year, we're really, we should be able to fine tune it. And by year, end of year three, we should be, you know, pretty much on point and we won't have to tweak anymore big unless rule changes or they start playing it all in the, 
you know, uh, Indonesia or somewhere every weekend, you know, <laughs> who knows where they're going to play it now. You know, something crazy happens where they change the shape of the football or something. Until that dramatic happens, next two, three years, we should be stronger still. And, and anyway, and, yeah, go ahead. And, and here's the thing, professors, our, our tools mm -hmm. can all be used together because we're not really sure which is stronger at any particular position, but we know that each of them work. So they all have a value that they bring. They're all looking at the data from a slightly different way. It all has to do with scoring, though. It has and nothing. And it's weekly value-based. Weekly value-based. It's looking at just points scored. It's not looking at exotic stats that may or may not result in fantasy points. It's just looking at fantasy points. It's just a different way, slightly different way, looking at each. What we'll probably discover and this is my hypothesis. This is why we're testing. I think we will find certain metrics that do better at certain positions versus the other metrics. I think we will see different metrics that do a better job in building a roster in redraft versus best ball. And I think we will see some combination of our tools Maybe it's the Bush number combined with MVP that is more powerful than MVP or Bush on its own for a particular position. So we already know MVP does pretty good at quarterback. Well, it does better at quarterback and running and back. It, yep. At wide receiver and tight end, it's about the same as the consensus out there, the way everybody and, else is and, playing. And, and I will say this on that point. I did not test. Uh, all I looked at was overall success and you yes. were good, but I didn't ask where there was a divergence. In other words, did MVP in tight ends and WRs, did that tend to point the way more than the public? I didn't compare player by player, Dennis, I just looked at the whole slate and said, as a group, the whole restaurant, not just one table or one dish. So there is more to be said about, you know, how do we measure success? There's that definition issue again. Yeah. And, and measuring success is always so tough in fantasy football. It comes down for me to ROI. Did this tool help me build a team that won? <laughs> Am I winning more often because I'm smarter in how I build a team? But it's also the difference in how you look at a grade. For instance, last year, we're picking Puka Nakua as, what, maybe the 65th wide receiver off the board? Puka Nakua would have been a success to me if he finished anywhere in the top 35, because that means he was a good flex starter every week for me at wide receiver. Now, if I'm picking a player at 65 and he ends up 58th on the season, I don't care. Like that's plus seven when people grade it. To me, that's a miss. When I'm picking a player that late, I care only if he makes the top 35. If he doesn't make the top 35 or come close to that on a weekly value basis, I could care less where he finishes because he didn't help my team. Whether it's 58th or 98th or 150th, he didn't help my team. So I don't care where he finishes because I've probably replaced him by then. But that's the difference of a scientist looking at this versus a fantasy football guy. Cause a fantasy football guy, if he says WR 65, he's my guy. He finishes WR 60. That's five points to the good. That didn't help you win. That's the difference of what we're trying to do professor, where we're trying to build a team that will win you money. So we're looking at the opportunities later in the draft 
to have a big splash. And we are finding that sometimes, because we're looking at players only on the full games that they played, that we are catching some things that year-end points and points per game are not. And we're finding these values late in drafts before they break out. We're finding data that says they could be really good. And then we're jumping on that player maybe a year earlier than some other people are. There's an advantage there as well. I agree. And I'm looking forward to this timeline where we're investigating. Anyway, Dennis, I thought we'd go through a few blocks of rounds. Yes. I like to uh, get a little closer in. This round's one to four. Uh, this is the distribution. You can see the orange lines are the, the uh, rounds. So the first block, round one, two, three, and four. Put some stars just to show uh, where 12 were drafted. So, uh, or maybe, maybe we're more than 12 were drafted now that I forgot why I put the stars. That's 12 and then that's 24. So you've yeah, got 24. Yep. Okay. So that's what that is anyway. So I've got that, but then let's turn to here's draft one round one for us, Dennis. We have the rank, the ADP, the round, the player, the position, the team, the buy, the ADP positional rank. The average of the Bush Middleson metric position rank, Vegas's position rank. I'll have this all for y'all to look at, folks. Difference is difference between ours and the public, and V difference is Vegas difference between them and the public. So now, Dennis, I've added this. We didn't have this for draft night out. Now I've got both here. So folks get the advantage and I sorted by position. So you can only focus on the five RBs round one and WRs round one. And I color coded in purple are the ones that we are have concerns about. That is, uh, we're much lower than the public and the green uh, and there's none here in round one, is if you see a green, that means we really like it more than the public. So the takeaway here was uh, surprisingly that uh, we have uh, concerns about Bijan Robinson, Jonathan Taylor, Jamar Chase, and Garrett Wilson. Vegas has a problem with Barkley, Bijan, and Brisson. So the, a lot of the running backs... Vegas is a little suspicious of relative to the other ones. So that was, in other words, it looked like you can't really do bad, but, or you can make a big mistake, which is, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking like that. I wasn't thinking when I looked round by round to what I was thinking, oh, we'll have some, some, uh, overlays and underlays right the the fades yep. and not fade but this looks like all you can do is really really put yourself in a lot of uh uncertainty early on and then you you know you could get in a bind so it looks like and chase is a minus six so it's not i mean garrett wilson minus 21 dennis he is just i haven't taken him at all in any of my redrafts just because taking him in round one seems very scary. I like Taylor. I like Bijan, but I think there are situations with there. There's, I think this is one way this could be an uncertainty measurement. Like there's yes. some things there that is just not settled. No nope, Brees Hall. We're right on point with everybody Vegas is a little yep. suspicious, but we, to me, I think we know what we got last year. You feel like you at least get that this year versus Bijan, you know, cousins is there new things, Taylor, Anthony Reed back. And, and, you know, there's some scariness to some of those players here, Dennis round one. Yeah. And we use this in our draft night out because we had a choice at 111. The guys that we were considering were Jonathan Taylor, 
Saquon Barkley, all of the wide receivers we like were gone. Plus Garrett Wilson was already gone. Yeah. So we didn't even have to think about that one. Nope. But the decision we had was between Taylor Barkley or to go to the second round. And, and if you pull the second round in and look at Henry, a plus nine. And that's why we grabbed him. We like our his. metrics show he he is the class of the field here in the second and a plus nine since we're almost to the second round. It didn't seem like a reach. No, it didn't seem like a reach. And we had him ranked above the other running backs that were available. We would have taken Brees Hall or CMC. <laughs> like oh, if we were drafting early in the, yeah, in the that, round, that would, we, that would have been the choice. We'd have been all over those two guys. Or, we love those uh, two guys. You know, assuming we'd Lamb take, plays. I mean, if we got take, an early pit, we would have gone Hill or Lamb or certainly uh, probably Lamb. Brown God, and Hill, yeah. Sun God, maybe A.J. Brown, if he was available, maybe right. Justin Jefferson. All those guys were gone. Yeah. So we said, uh-uh, Derrick Henry, just because it's the 11th pick and Derrick Henry isn't going until, what, 14th pick, 13th pick on average, we were like, no, we're cool with that, 20th pick on average. We're, we're like, we're cool with that. We'll take him early because we are so far ahead on our metrics. We have a number three, Dennis. It is Yo, so yeah. skewed. Yeah. So we, we grabbed the guy. We grabbed the gusto of the guy that we wanted. And this was all driven by our metrics and the Vegas metrics. When we saw him in green, we're like, yeah, He's well, the time. only player in round two that's in green. And, and and then having to get Kelsey, which is on point. Oh, we, yeah. Uh, we all agree he's the top choice. I know people are drafting Laporta just a tad above, but I, I see it the other way. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we it just seemed to be a nice – I think the first, second picks – I really feel we did, given our draft position, we did as good as we could have done. They let, you know, I th I think we we didn't lose any anything as far as competitiveness with some of those top top folks. We stayed equal or above a, a lot of them, and that that's, you know, I was very satisfied with that. I mean, the only unknown is. Marvin Harrison, we just don't know what we – I mean, you think it's going to work? I mean, should we've got Henry and him? Kelsey is such a known quantity and, and tight ends and everything. And this was a tight end premium, Dennis? It, it was not tight end premium, but, but I but have But, boy, he catches so many passes. It's, it's like it's, a, he gets us a premium because of that. His performance – is always equal to to about the 12th to 15th best wide receiver. So yeah. I'm, I'm taking that as my tight end because now we did two things with that pick. One, we put the attention on the tight end position. Oh, before I forget, look at Vegas. They got him plus 10. Yes. So, you know, we're, we, we're all in on Vegas. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the, that's how we use this data in an actual draft. And if other players had been there, we would have considered them. But when you've got a guy in green, who's just screaming off the board at you, I'm taking him nine places before his ADP, because I know he's not going to be available to me. No, I he would have been I, gone. He would have been gone before our second pick. And I had a feeling like we read tip who was between us and the pick. And we said, I don't think tips going with a tight end here. Nope. I don't think he's going to start the second round with a tight end. And he took the other running back that we liked, which was Taylor, but we don't like him as much as Henry. And then he took another wide receiver. And I was like, no, I'm good. There's like the wide receivers that are available here. I'm not 
drooling over them. And we knew from our analysis of ADP that there were going to be some guys that we really liked better than the consensus that would fall to us. But this is how you use this data, folks. If you got a yeah, and then uh we did we get Samuel at some point? No. No, not in the Sam league. Samuel in the third round is a yes. plus six for us. Oh, but look geez. at Vegas minus sixteen. So Dennis, what's going to be part of our platform that we'll have? We're going to look at those. Samuel's a great example. Six, six. How many times is Vegas right? Or are we are we beating Vegas? I guess will be another way. That's going to be very. I mean, I'm so I'm I'm like I need my time machine now, Dennis. So I need to go <laughs> into January and start my you know I need to start next year's preseason. Well, I want to know these answers now. I'm just so excited having all this down ready for our our listeners for next year. Can you imagine that we'll have some of these things? And maybe Vegas is a welcome saying, you know, you're fools going against Vegas. Well, great. Let, prove me to me that I'm a fool taking Samuel because Vegas is so down. That'd be great, folks. I I will be glad to be wrong because I won't be wrong that many years because I'm going to I'm going to use Vegas metrics, maybe, you know, or whatever. You know, I'm looking for that trick. But but and, here's the here's the difference in what they're looking at. Okay, so we're looking at weekly values. Yes, we are. We don't care. This is end of the season points. That's end of true. the season points. We don't care if a guy misses three or four games a season. Now, if he does miss three or four games a season and Vegas is expecting that because he's done it, they're not trying to predict injuries. They're just saying this guy has missed an average of two to four games a year over the last three seasons. So we are going to lower his prop to account for those missed games. But the reality is if they're wrong about him missing games, our metrics might point out some possible year end props that we want to play. So in other words, we might love that over on Debo because if he doesn't get hurt, he going to cash for us. And that's another beta test folks that we're going to do this season is to see how these Vegas metrics respond to the real world. And we'll know more at this time next year, but right now we're using it to flag guys. So we can say, okay, our metrics love him. Vegas doesn't. Why? And if you know the why, you can react. But here's the thing. Vegas still has him at, at wide receiver 33. So in our league that we just drafted by the third round, the 21st guy was going off the board. So that's not a huge difference. I, I'm not afraid of reaching 10 spots, 12 spots ahead for a guy that we rank to be 11th. So we're getting the, what we think is the 11th best on weekly value as the 21st guy off the board. I'll take that chance. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so this is, uh, these figures also show you uh, how many positions are taken by each round. So we have third round, two running backs there. So, so this is the, the tight end and, and WR. So if you know that coming in, Dennis, you know, this is your last shot at Andrews or uh, at Evan Ingram. If you need that, right, if you're, and especially in a tight end premium, which this is, you know, this is last call for some of these tight, if you missed on the top, this is it. There's, you know, it's it's going to get lean at this point. So I do like uh, kind of looking round by round, and I've been consulting this this afternoon while I'm 
doing my drafts here, Dennis, like that. Who did we get in the third round? We uh, actually we actually took a reach to the fourth round for Joe Mixon. So Mixon was actually rated better for us. Um, you know, and it looks like he was well, actually dropped yeah, a couple of rounds. He's dropped yeah, all the way and, to the fifth now. Yeah, and he, we got him a plus 10. Yeah. So Henry was a plus nine. Mixon's a plus 10, Dennis. And, so, and we we got him in the third. We could have probably seen if he would have come around. But plus 10 was better than anything we were staring at in the third round. So What did we get it, in the fourth round? So we got Mixon. Who would we get next? Fourth Pittman? Round. We got Pittman. Yeah. Uh, Plus so we're six. feeling pretty good about that. So you see the you see the consistency, guys. We're we're plus on everybody that we liked. We we were, we drafting were working plus guys. that that metric here, and uh, you know, look at Vegas, Kamara minus twenty four, Rashid Wright minus ten. They love Jacobs. I have been taking a safe fourth round pick, Jacobs in a lot of my recent redrafts. It's not like, you know, again, hoping Mixon stays to the fifth since I know that he's going there, Dennis. If I'm wanting an RB, RB, Jacobs has been my go-to because we're we're right there. And Vegas is hinting that they love that. So I'm using kind of skewing to the, the Vegas metric here. And I really appreciate that is a way for us because when we have a minus one or a plus one or a zero or a plus two minus, it's, it's, it's just saying we're seeing it the same way. And it's nice when Vegas, another data stream can tell us something different and they're waving the flag saying, Hey, you got something here. Vegas is telling you versus hey. Kamara, be careful. We're a minus yes. five on him. Vegas minus twenty. That scares me. Yeah, and and that's a great way to use this data. And remember, the guy that we had our eyes on for the fourth round was Devonta Smith, and he went one pick before us. We wanted Devonta. Now but, we're but about Pittman, even. But Pittman, Pittman was, was solid. Great. Yeah, Pittman was solid. And so DJ Moore, Vegas likes. We like so. Dennis, I can see a metric, call it the double here, right? Where we love it. And, you know, so I need to do the box and whisker on these differences for us and ask, you know, try to look at some of these doublets to where we're with Vegas or against Vegas. You know, I'm curious to see what all that means. You know, how in enlightening is it? I think for next year's, uh, into the season props, I think we'll be in a better shape for some betting. Dennis and I are going to experiment, folks. That means we're not betting the house this year because we don't know. I mean, people love, and you know, I don't, I don't like to gamble, Dennis. I like to invest. Yes. Right. So I, I try to convince my wife that horse racing is an investment. <laughs> Sometimes when I got that W2G form and I'm filing my taxes on my winnings, she buys that. But other times, when, you know, <laughs> I'm coming home in the barrel and we're having the old value meal, which is not a value anymore at McDonald's. So, so remember the target. I do like the definitions that shift when I have to come home and explain where that bankroll went with the ponies ponies can be or folks if you want to test your gambling persona your any flaws in your system in (laughs) you if you're curious you know what's my weaknesses if you still don't know if you're still relatively young dennis and i are, are seasoned in our 60s we're seasoned okay we we like that blackening season in it, the Cajun, that fish. We've been seared on both sides. Life. We got a tough hide now. And uh, yeah, Dennis laughing. But I'm telling you, folks, go to the racetrack and hit two or three in a row and watch yourself go crazy, thinking you got, you know, 
when you think, how long is this game? How come I'm not at the track every day? You know, you should immediately stop and buy the hot dog man, give him a tip, buy a hot dog and walk out the door because you're wrong. And the, the horses will, will lower your spirits so quick <laughs> and you will, you Ooh. know, they will knock you out. And fantasy, see, you can be strung along the whole season. <laughs> and then the sadness with the horse race is two minutes. You know if you're the goat or the the zero real quick. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I can speak of getting my butt kicked recently in with the ponies because for a while there, a couple of years ago, I was serious about it. So I put you know, it, serious for me. I put 50 bucks into an account so I could bet online. And I had it up to 220, Professor. I was serious about it for about a year. And I was nice. handicapping. I got me up to 220. And then I just decided, you know, this isn't as interesting as fantasy football stats. I'm not going to spend as much time. But I still love horse racing. Oh, I love the sport of horse racing. Well, I've two and five dollar bet myself down to like seventy something in that in that payroll. I've been on a nasty losing streak. I probably should have cashed out at two fifty and called it a day, but I like to dabble with a two dollar or five dollar win better or whatever. And uh, sadly, I my my bankroll is has shrunk. So I. <laughs> I either better cash out before I lose it all or, well, what the heck. If it if you lose it and all you spent was 50 bucks to start and you enjoyed it for the last, it's been five years now, I guess, since I've had that account. Um, I've enjoyed it. You know, I sit there when I got nothing better to do and haven't, don't want to jump into a fantasy football uh, stat, you know, discussion or study and, you know, watch a couple of races, try to hit, I read, I read Ortiz at a nice rate uh, on a on a live horse, and uh, he just hasn't been paying off as often to me as I should. Now William Buick has been very kind to me over the years, so maybe I got to wait till uh, till the time of the uh, uh, of either European races in the morning and bet bet on the Buick, or I got to uh, wait until. Uh, so we get to the end of the season and the uh and the fancy races in November uh when the Breeders' he, Cup Breeders' Cup when he comes over this side of the pond. But anyway, I digress. But you're right, Professor. If we see advantages here, we're just gonna be dabbling with small bets because we don't care how much we win, we do care how much we lose. And when you're yeah. testing something, a dollar bet is as good as a hundred dollar bet. It it tells you what you need to do, what you need to know. Did I win? Did I lose? Did my bankroll increase? Did it decrease? When you're doing a beta test, don't invest a lot of money in it. If the beta test works, then we'll start investing a little more money in it and we'll make some good money. But we're not sure what we've got yet. And uh, so we will have more information on that, you know, at the end of the season. So use this and, you know, Dennis, I'm, I'm sure we're can't cover every round, but I, I go through the different rounds and I've tried to highlight it and I'll post these up on the site so people can look. But again, I like to look at the pattern. I like to consider what I'm getting into here. And uh, it's really been an interesting year because coming off best ball, and just looking at the patterns, like, for instance, rounds five to eight tied in. It's like one tied in, uh, one two every here third. around. Yeah. yeah, and then one. So it's like everybody's rushing. Look, look at the rush. Seven, bam. Everybody wants in. And then, oh, let's wait. It's kind of like a super tier of seven. And then we're just going to dabble it out. It, and so it, half your league is going to have a tight end by the end of round three, another way to think about it. So you can make some predictions. Do you want an early tight end this year or not? That's the question. So just 
when you have some thoughts, put it in a question. Uh, in science, that's how I like to think about things, is put it in a question form that makes it, kind of makes your mind want to try to answer that and think about different possibilities. So that's a big question in the first four rounds for me in a tight end premium. Uh, I think the obvious one is, do I want an RB or WR round one? That's everybody's focused on that. There's a lot of, uh, you know, people, you know, get all stirred up about that. And uh, it just depends. Uh, if I have first three or four picks, I'm probably going RB. If I've got later picks, then maybe WR. I mean, it just depends on what's there. And Dennis and I talked about going for Henry, that I'm happy with, with that uh, choice that we had. Yeah, if you look at your <coughs> metrics here and you go round by round and all you do on the players, <coughs> when, when you look at player by player picks mm -hmm. of who's going in those specific rounds, and you go, if you drafted, if you your your goal was to set out and draft a group of players where our metrics and Vegas were both in agreement that it was a plus player, that it was a, a green, a player in green yep. on your sheet. Uh -huh. Look at the look at the team you'd build with picking guys from the green in each of these rounds. So the first round, we don't, we don't really have, have anybody in green, but we've got a lot of good guys. Yeah. So we're happy with whoever we leave. Second round, round Henry. Round two, we got Henry. I love that pick. Round, round three, three, you got a choice, Samuel or A-Chain. So you're either going a with a running back or a wide receiver there. And then, you know. Wide round receiver four. round four. You got Look three that. choices. Look at how how this just sets you up for building an excellent team. And you if you around. wanted the super safe, according to Vegas, DJ Moore plus six plus seven. Yeah. Pittman is plus six minus three. Diggs plus seventeen minus three. So there is some uh, situation there. So you've got some good ones there. I mean, if you're looking for. Then round five, it's Mixon, Cooper, Tank yeah. Dell. Yeah. Round six, you got Connor. We love Connor. Rasheed Rice, Vegas didn't put a prop out because suspended. of all his issues. Yeah. He doesn't get suspended. You got a nice pick. He's a bargain in the sixth. I'm, I'm even taking him in the fifth in a few circumstances. Yeah. Look at and, these green players. Yeah. Round seven, Mosher, Allen, Reed, Watson. Yeah. We love right. the back class on Allen. We sure do. I like Pollard. Vegas likes Pollard, Dennis, in the eighth round, plus seven, yeah. plus 13. I've, I've been warming to him. Well, I mean, he's probably your three or four. Yeah. How could you, you know, leave, taking Henry spot, he's going to get enough action to make him a good three or four. I really believe that he wouldn't be my one. He wouldn't be my two, but he seems to be the three. If you need that. Uh, and then let's see who else uh, round nine, Chubb, Eckler, Hawkinson, Hopkins, Sutton. I know there's injury and other issues there, but this round nine folks. Take I a mean, chance. Those are, take, yeah, Ford, Chubb is, Gus Chubb Edwards. Is, yeah, Chubb yeah. when he's healthy for the games he plays this year, yeah. he's for, he's late first, early second talent. Hawkinson's second round talent all day long when he comes back, and then Vegas we love the, even like he's a plus six yeah. with Vegas. They like him. And yeah, he'd be a great tight end too this year, folks. If you and wanted to get greedy in a tight end premium, I have. Uh, especially in best ball, I teamed him oh, up yeah. with the the early ones with him and then came back with the third tight end in best ball there. Round 10, Ford, Edwards. Uh, Addison is kind of coming back to me a little bit. I, at round 10, I'm not, you know, he's your fourth maybe. Yeah. Samuel even as a fourth 
is not, you know, and by this time, and I know Brian Thomas is getting a lot of uh, uh, discussion here. We don't know what to do with him, folks. Oh, Vegas doesn't know. There's a lot of talk about, about him. And, and here's the thing with our metrics. So a player like Chase Brown, who went a couple of rounds earlier, yeah, we we don't know what Chase Brown is with our metrics because we didn't even have four full games nope. to really check him. So we you got a rookie, you got a second round or, or second year player who's got light a, a light resume that you have to veer a little bit away from the from our data set, and you've got to project. And I do that with my MVP. I project what I think they should be, but my goodness, if you just built a team full of this, these green players, yep, you'd be feeling pretty good every round. Yeah. So I'll have all these rounds for you guys. And, uh, you know, and then at the end, I just have uh, the way the rounds fall exactly. So I didn't sort just so you just see another way. I like to uh, look different ways at something, right? Different in, in biology, when we're dissecting uh, frogs, you can do uh, a sagittal cut or a kind of a, a, a hard, a, like a horizontal or a, a vertical. And you get to see different structures and things and that's what I like to do. I'm not just satisfied with however's being presented. I like to make my own visual. Uh, the data artist in me li loves the colors, Dennis. I mm -hmm. love the comparison of, of different metrics and whatnot. But anyway, I've got all 20 rounds just the way it's it's being spit out. So you can use that as well as a thing. And, and, yeah. and here's the thing, Professor. Yeah. Just because we're showing Bijan Robinson and Jamar Chase and Garrett Wilson and Jonathan Taylor in the red of our differences there, where we're yeah. showing a difference versus where they're going in the draft, doesn't mean we hate these players. What it means is there's a little more risk. Early rounds, I like to avoid risk at all costs i want the positive players as much as i can the later i go in a draft the less i care about safety the more i'm looking for opportunity the more i'm looking just at upside but in those first key five rounds of a fantasy football draft i want safety i want reliability I will sacrifice a little bit of the ceiling so I don't have to pick myself up off to a very, very low floor. And uh, again, I like different ways to look at data. And so Dennis, I'm going to show you my team structure data. It's a little hard to see. So, you know, uh, Eat your carrots here and get ready. But uh, sometimes <laughs> uh, Excel does things a little funny here. So uh, anyway, let me share team structure with you. Again, a little hard to see, but those little colored points represent under the player, represent our five metrics, Dennis. So this is KC. You can see Mahomes. And, you know, you inspired me when you say, well, why don't you treat our five metrics like the, the, the Olympics? I love it. Top and bottom. So we could, for instance, Mahomes, you could draw a line between his mid three here and that put him near an 80, you know, 79, 80 right there. Here's Clyde Edwards Solaire. Has pretty good, but boy, has pretty bad. Yeah. 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 So if you drew his, it would be a big oblong. Notice Pacheco, really solid right here. So uh I drew, look at Kelsey. Oh my God, three <laughs> sitting up there. 
folks. That's why we really love him right there. Here's Hollywood Brown. Here's Rice. Rice just a tad above him. So, uh, but didn't Hollywood Brown get get uh, get hurt? hurt? Yeah. Yep. And then rookies are where we didn't get a reading. It's just zero. We don't know. So you guess, we guess. But this is team structure. I'm not going to show all 32 teams. I'm, I don't know if I'm going to show all this yet. But wh what I envision, Dennis, is a visual way for us to go into the season thinking about the floor ceiling, but actually see it, not with the box and whisker versus just actually plotting the our five metrics. And just use this to imagine players. And one that I thought was really interesting since we did take uh, Seattle, Look at Tyler Lockett out here, Dennis. Oh, my goodness. Right there. And that's even better than JSN. I know we're for, people are forecasting him, but even if you forecasted him up to his best and Tyler Lockett was right there at his worst, they could – I think it's going to be more of a muddled mess than people think with healthy three – it, it, I don't think this is the year for JSM to be above Bedcalf and, and Lockett. I think it's going to be weekly. Who is it? Whose turn is it? I think Medcalf seems to have the solid, but he has some. In other words, if we're here, here, and here, you could have them all three about the, the same. But the price on Lockett compared to these two. Cheap. Yeah. So this is another way, you know, this is a good tool if you know and you've been drafting a lot, folks. Look at uh, Walker right here. Uh, Charbonnet, people talking about what well, Charbonnet is going, eh, I don't think so. I mean, look at the differences if you drew the little circle versus his circle. Wow. It's like near zero almost. But, but um, here's where I here's where I love this backfield you know who the number one and number two are. So very clear. If, if I decide that I take Walker, I'm probably taking Charbonnet as the, as the pure handcuff. Yeah. I don't expect him to beat him out, but if Walker gets dinged and gets slowed, Charbonnet can do everything. He does have one Walker. point yeah, up there got, that, that that's could close. keep up with. Yeah. So that's why I say he's not going to be a huge drop off if something happens to Walker or if, you know, and, and here's the wonderful thing about that professor. Yeah. Sometimes the best strategy in a, in a backfield that is so one and one a or a one and two. Yeah. That's why I turned them, to Pittsburgh. <laughs> grab them both. Yeah. Jalen Warren and Harris. If you Ooh. do the the blob, it would be here, here. Yeah. Warren is below Harris, yep. but they're close. But it's not like one's dominant over the other. And, and so, it's very and it's yeah. very possible that unlike Seattle, where I think there will be a pecking order and I think there will be a volume. This could be hot hand. This, this could be depending could, on the matchup. Yeah. Could be a 50-50 split all damn year we saw the same offensive coordinator well the, he was the head coach of atlanta last year and we saw him take volume away from Bijan robinson and give it to tyler algier Bijan and tyler there's a bigger difference between those two than there is harris and warren i'm looking at a 50 50 split i'm scared of that backfield even though I'm pretty sure who the one and one a or the one and two are, I'm not so sure it stays the same all season long. And I, and I kind of think Harris loses a little volume and Warren maybe picks up a little volume, making them almost identical. So that's a tough read. So again, I'll have uh, this, these team structures frozen in place 
we can look at the end of the year, look, you know, update the metrics. And I think this could be another way to gauge a team level pecking order thing. And I'm just, I'm just gathering the data. Like I said, you, with your Olympic comment, I just saw this, you know, I was just, th and again, I, folks, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to put this out because I don't, I don't know how useful it is right now. I, I think it's just a thinking tool. If you're curious, if if I'm asking, well, what's going on in Pittsburgh? This would be the first, no, not the last. This would be the one of the first places I do look at it. Then I would go to our metrics and track these players and look at Vegas. And, you know, it, it's like getting the whole piece of the pie, you know, the crust, the bottom, the <laughs> filling. You just can't pick the top, you know, like, you know, little kids, they'll tear the crust off a sandwich or, you know, they'll take the Oreo and li lick the middle and throw the cookies away. I mean, that, I don't know. I don't know if this is of use or not, but this didn't take me too long. But Dennis, well, this was a result when you inspired me with your Olympic comment about our and, five and metrics. And one of the things that might end up happening out of this professor, mm. and again, beta testing this year yep in fantasy football we tend to think in one result mentality okay so we say so and so he's the wr16 and we we put it all on one thing looking at this olympic scoring idea if we throw out the high, throw out the low, and take that middle three, yep. maybe that gives us a range. Mm -hmm. We understand. And some guys might have a range of when we throw out the high and the low and we look at the three metrics, their high and their low might be very close. Like The middle three might be very close to each other. So maybe the range with some guys mm -hmm. is WR12 on the high side, WR14 on the worst of those three metrics. Whereas another player might be WR6, WR22. Now we get to choose. Do we want safety or do we want the upside? And we know through our strategy decisions before that a lot of that decision is made for us by where we are drafting this player in the draft if he's real early we want that tight bullet at a high level we want less uncertainty we want three metrics that are on top of each other and all scream one position whereas late in the draft if we've got that outlier that's much much higher that gives us hope for that upside based on the numbers not just hope based on hope but hope yeah. based on hope, numbers hope. Yeah. hope based on numbers hope. that gives us a possible edge of understanding this variance in weather forecasting when i put out a storm warning for o'hare airport for instance and i said four to seven inches of snow i always gave them an alternate forecast because I know most likely if I blow that forecast, if it's not in that four to seven inch range, because of the type of snowstorm it is, because of the speed, because of the ingredients, all the moisture, every, every ingredient that goes into the snowstorm, I know, Professor, I'm more likely to get more snow on certain circumstances than my four to seven. And another four to seven forecast, I might have the alternate forecast to be less. So in fantasy football, I might have primary forecast, WR12. Best case, WR8. Worst case, WR18. But I will know I will have a relative level of confidence based on all the metrics that if I'm wrong on 12, it's more likely to be the, the upside. That's valuable information. In weather forecasting, 
if your primary and your secondary forecast hit about 96% of the time, which is what we did at United Airlines, that was a valuable piece of information for the client. Because if we were saying four to seven inches and we were saying, okay, if we bust this forecast, it's going to be lighter, they would have fewer people standing by, fewer pieces of equipment ready than if we said four to seven, but if we blow it, you're going to get a foot of snow. They knew they were calling everybody out, not because they didn't trust our four to seven inch forecast, but because the alternative was going to be worse. And they knew to prepare for the worst, or at least have guys on call that they could bring in, know that they were going to have to pivot to a different strategy. And that's what we can do in fantasy football with this range of outcomes that is built by five different and you add Vegas, six different metrics. That now gives me confidence if I throw out the high and the low and I look at the spread of the other four, I know what that player is all about. Look at Kelsey, for instance. All of his metrics were at the top of the chart. He's the elite of the elite. CMC is the same way. If you can collect the elite of the elite, you're going to build yourself a great team. The rest of the players fall in around it. But I love that idea of using those the grouping of metrics to maybe define a range. We'll have to work on that for next season. Yes, we will. But I just wanted to introduce it now and let you see it. So it's there. I don't know if I'll put it out or not. I don't know. if I, I'm not sure I know how to use it yet. I, I think, as you mentioned use it as, as kind of a guide. So maybe I will just copy those and throw it out on our site, Science of Fantasy. Some and you've got day- your forecast coming. Oh, so I'm yeah. excited about that as well. So people will not be coming to our site. Well, wonder <laughs> what metrics they got. We got more than you need, folks. We're, we're going to have it all covered. A lot of metrics, a lot of data, a lot of forecasts, and a lot of information. And here's the thing, folks. If we we prepare a lot of different things, we do a lot of different studies. If our conclusion at the end of a study is that, A, we don't, ex- we don't understand the data yet, which can happen in science, or number two, we don't see an actionable use for this data at this time, We aren't going to share it with you. We're not going to overload you with the stuff that does not have action that you can take and make money off of. That's kind of how we work here over at scienceoffantasyfootball.com. So head on over to scienceoffantasyfootball.com. Check out all of the professor's useful data on ADP. He is the master at breaking this stuff down. I have learned a lot from the professor and his studies, all of the professor's videos, whether you're a newbie to fantasy football and you just stumbled across this for the first time, or are you a seasoned veteran, you will learn from the professor's lesson plan. It's like going to an online fantasy football college, folks. Check out my articles on the MVP index. Find out what this crazy thing is that you keep hearing me talk about every day over at D Mike media on Twitter. And of course, head on back here next week for another edition of the science of fantasy football. Get to work folks.